The importance of culture, religion, and a cult of personality around your brand. Why accurately forecasting your growth goals can be even better than exceeding them. And a reminder that the most effective qualitative marketing transcends the tools, technology, and data available. That and more on this episode of Advertising Influencers. Advertising Influencers. Conversations with today's top tier marketers from Silicon Valley and beyond. Powered by Instapage, the most powerful landing page solution. Hello, hello. Hope you're doing very well whenever and wherever you are listening. And welcome to this episode of Advertising Influencers, the podcast powered by Instapage, where we speak weekly with the best and brightest minds in the digital marketing space as they share their stories, their perspectives, and in some cases, their secret sauce to how they break through the noise and grow their businesses. Last week, we spoke with a man who helped launch Virgin American Airlines and the Apple Genius Bar. His name is Demetrios Papadagonas, and we spoke on what it means to have a truly authentic brand. That conversation was a truly valuable experience, and I'm saying that actually on a personal level. Imagine that will apply to you as well, so after this episode, check it out when you have a chance. But I could not be more thrilled right now, in this very moment for the conversation that I'm about to share with you. Momentarily, we will sit down with Rob Meinhart, a former founder and CEO who is currently spending his time as a board member and advisor at a number of startups, and most importantly, as an investor and partner at Toba Capital, a venture capital and private equity firm here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Rob's VC perspective and the multiple companies he led to successful acquisitions, in my opinion, totally sets him apart from the rest of the guests we've had on the podcast so far. He's also the former CEO of my boss and our VP of marketing at Instapage, Saranya Babu, who tells me that he has an incredible ability for creating a culture around a brand. And that includes the employees as well as the customers. There is a lot to talk about with Rob and a lot to be learned. So let's head down to his home office in Menlo Park, right in the heart of Silicon Valley, and go say hello. So this is a very exciting to interview Rob Meinhart. Again, pleasure being here, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this in your busy schedule. Yeah, absolutely. Rob, right now, you are a partner at Toba Capital. But from my understanding and from what Saranya, our VP of marketing over at Instapage, has told me, she previously worked underneath you, you've got quite the background that led you to what you're doing right now with Toba, advising and investing in these companies. So I think the best place to start would be hearing a little bit about your story, maybe the 30-second nutshell of how you got to where you are today. I can tell it really quick. I got an early interest in technology. My parents bought me a computer but said... Day one, you can have a computer, but no games. So I was sort of forced into teaching myself how to program to build a few games for myself because I couldn't figure out why else you'd want to have a computer when I was 14 years old. But then that just followed after college and I got involved initially for a, a boutique consulting firm doing strategy and marketing consulting work for probably right out of college, maybe 20 or 30 different companies over an eight year period. And then I've been on the founding team of two companies. One was called Avant Go, which was a very early pioneer in the mobile space back in the late 90s. It was a great, terrific company. Basically, anyone who had a Palm Pilot or a BlackBerry in those days had Avant Go on their device. And then I was the co-founder of a company called Case Networks, which is a systems management software company, uh, which we grew from zero to about 20 million and sold to Dell. And within Dell, we grew at over $100 million in revenue. So that's kind of been my background in technology. After that, got involved in investing uh, with Toba Capital. What would you say throughout this entire process until you arrived at Toba Capital is your general marketing philosophy? How has it changed over all the years you've been doing this? I guess in a nutshell, I'd call it irreverence. I think that you have to grab people's attention in some way. And I think people generally take too conservative a route with their marketing strategy. And so I always try to do something that's new that hasn't been done or thought about before. That's generally what I look for in marketing, how I think about marketing. I guess I would sort of bookend that with saying that marketing is also something that you have to do every day and you have to have a drumbeat around marketing. And so I also believe in sort of more traditional concepts of marketing too, like just get up, do it every day and make sure that you're in front of people.
And a big part of that from my perspective and the perspective of many marketers as I've found is the importance of having a really quality team behind all of your marketing efforts. And based upon what Saranya told me, Having worked for you in the past at Case, I hear you've got a real knack for building these really loyal marketing teams with a great culture and a great set of really talented people. So I would personally, as well as the rest of our worldwide audience, love to hear how you were able to do that. What does that look like? What goes into it? There's a lot of stuff that goes into that, actually building great teams, but whether it's in marketing or, or any other organization, it's something I think that you learn over time as you try to grow teams and you make mistakes. And I've definitely made my fair share over time. But when, when we started Case, we really sat down with a blank slate and said, well, what do we do right and wrong in the past? And how do we apply that here? And I think there's a couple of learnings there. I mean, one is at Case, we tried to hire very senior people right out of the gate who had deep experience. And we were just maniacally crazy about interviewing people and making sure we knew who we were getting. If I was interviewing somebody at a VP level, for example, I might do an interview that lasts anywhere from two to four hours or maybe even longer over a multi-session interview and asking very long, open, deep types of questions like, take me through the most compelling marketing program you've ever done and take me through it in excruciating detail. How did you come up with the idea? How did you execute it? Uh, what what made it successful and really getting under the hoods as to how people built success in their career, I think is really important. I also spend a lot of time doing a lot of deep background checking to make sure that I'm not just getting sold a bill of goods, but that I really know who I'm hiring. I think that's a step that a lot of people miss. And if you miss that, you, you often miss things about chemistry or about how people are going to perform in a team that you're not picking up in an interview when somebody's kind of under their best behavior. So that's sort of all about selecting the right team, and, and there's a bunch of different elements of that. Those are a few. I think the secondary piece of that is how do you get these teams to gel and be great together over time? And I think there's at least a few different elements of this, and, and it actually kind of rolls into how do you do great marketing too, but creating great culture, creating a religion around why people are excited to come to work. That's about making work fun. That's about making their interpersonal relationships with other employees fun. One thing around that I used to do is I used to insist around whether it was marketing or any other organization, we don't start a conversation or even engage in a conversation because Susie did this, we have this problem. That's not a valid discussion in an organization that I would be running. Mm -hmm. It would be more like we have this problem as a company let's go figure out how to solve it. Too many times in organizations I've seen, even if it's sort of subtle but below the surface, the veneer, they tend to want to point blame or figure out blame or start with what's the cause. Mm -hmm. To me, cause is really sort of a bad place to start the discussion. It's like we are where we are. I don't really care how we got there. Maybe I care later because I don't want to make the same mistakes again. But right now what I care about is getting out of this. And that's really where you can create positive working relationships among different people. And I think the last thing that is important in building great teams is basically being the type of leader that's willing to walk in the same shoes of the people that you're trying to lead. That means that you're running a company where people are making maybe below industry standard wage. You've got to be willing to make that sacrifice as well. If that's an organization where you expect people to work extra hours on a weekend, they need to see you doing those sorts of things. And just in general, just treating people great and with respect the same way you'd want to be treated. When I was running Case, I started when it was two people, myself and a co-founder. And when we left inside of Dell, I think there were close to 750 people in the organization all around the world. And so you get into questions, you're hitting on a question of sort of time and scale and geographic distribution. And I think the only way to maintain great culture when you're doing that is to really create what I'll call a religion, you know, sort of a fanaticism that sort of transcends you as a founder. It's really about the company. And that concept of religion to me is important in marketing in general. You create a club that people want to be a part of at the end of the day. That's really important in marketing and retaining great people and retaining great culture. And exactly how you hit that nerve, I think, depends on the people that you have in your company and the type of people you're selling to. For example, in our world at Case, we sold to IT professionals who are typically 30 to 45-year-old males. And so we tried to create a culture of as a company that they really related to. And it got them super excited about being part of the company. And that got our employees super excited being part of the company. We can explore that more maybe later when we talk about what it takes to be an effective marketer because I think religion is an important aspect of that. One last thing on the employee side of things is that 
it's not just that religious piece, but it's kind of how you treat people. For example, we used to do a annual summer picnic and most people rolled their eyes like, great, I've got to go spend time with my colleagues on a Saturday afternoon at some stupid park with their snot-nosed kids. Well, that's one way to think about it, but we used to throw our party in the middle of the week on a Wednesday. We'd give everybody the day off of work. We'd go to the beach. We'd have a barbecue. We'd invite everybody's families. Sounds like a great place to work. Yeah, I mean, we'd do stuff like that. Or another example was, and this is maybe a secret I haven't let out of the bag fully, is I used to run the whole company on one credit card. We got a ton of mileage, a ton of points, and I would give, I would give gifts to people all the time in lieu of like a cash bonus. And that serves a really important purpose. Like if yeah. I walk up to you and you've done a great job as a marketer and I give you the ability to buy with points that we've earned on our corporate credit card, let's say a flat panel TV or to go to a nice hotel for the weekend with your wife, you could argue you'd prefer the cash, but it's family level recognition because now your wife sees that you're getting recognized at work in a different way. It's not just money that's going in the account and going to be used to buy food the next week. It's like hey, somebody cared enough to go do something for me. So it's those sorts of things I think create a lot of loyalty and excitement in a company. I imagine that thinking also translates into how you communicate with your personas and your prospective users or whatever you want to call them. How important is it to hire people for your marketing organization that are your target users and really reflect who your personas are? I think that depends on what you're marketing. In my situation, when I was selling case systems management products, I don't think it mattered at all. I think it mattered that people were fun and lively and willing to engage in the type of marketing that we wanted to do, but I don't think it mattered that much. Um, when you're talking about a different type of product, for example, we're an investor in a company called Trace, which makes a sports tracking device that they use on surfboards and snowboards and things like that. It's a little bit better to have a marketer who understands surfing culture or understands um, X Games type of culture because I think a lot of times you might get someone like me who just doesn't even know how to speak to that audience. But that's a pretty specialized consumer audience versus doing more B2B marketing. So I haven't thought about your question deeply, but maybe one way to break it is in a consumer marketing sense, maybe it does make a big difference to really understand and live that persona when it's more of a B2B marketing world. I think it's just an ability to get your head around that persona, which is a little bit easier because it's, for me at least, it's easier to relate to a 40-something IT guy than it is to relate to somebody who's a surfer or something like that, which is not a sport that I've participated in recently. So Right. That's kind of like working at internet radio or a music streaming company when you don't really care <laughs> about listening to music. If you're going to be building this product, you should probably at least be someone who's going to use mm -hmm. it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be putting all these features into a product where it just doesn't make sense. It's like, have you ever used iTunes? <laughs> but that is a different story. Well, no, I think that makes sense too. I mean, I, I, but there's a fine line too. I mean, I've, I've heard people that oversteer towards that, having everyone in the company who's done that thing before or participates in that activity or is that persona, you can't always create that and sometimes you can. There's probably just different ways to run things. In fact, I'm an investor right now in a company called Flowcast, which is one of most, my most exciting companies from my perspective. It's basically closed automation software, it helps companies uh, close the books faster and more accurately. And part of their tagline is built by accountants for accountants. And they've done a good job of, I don't know the exact percentage, but I'm going to guess two thirds of their employees have an accounting background. But they also have this kind of fun, playful marketing, grow a company, high tech background too. So it's so maybe bringing those two things together is pretty special. Totally agree. And on that note, let's actually shift gears towards what you're doing now, towards your work as a, a VC, as an investor and an advisor. When you're looking at companies to possibly invest in, how do you choose what to invest in? What do you look at, especially from a marketing perspective? What do you specifically have your eyes on for what they're doing or what you think they should be doing? Well, in making an initial investment, I'm not sure I'm, you know, I'm fairly new at the game. I'm two or three years into being a VC, so I'm not going to claim the hill of being the world's greatest venture capitalist. At this point, it definitely takes years, if not decades, to figure out whether you're any good at something. Uh, in, in this particular line of work because it takes that long to find out what the results are. Mm -hmm. 
But I would say in evaluating a new investment, I look for a few things. First, I look for relatability. Do I relate to the idea and understand it? Because if I don't, it makes it a lot harder for me to dig in and do the diligence that I need to validate whether it's a real opportunity. And similar to once I have something that I relate to, like in the world of Flowcast, I had a lot of challenges uh, in managing the closed process of our financial process, both as a standalone company and once we were a division inside of Dell. There's just a lot to do. So I really understood what they were trying to solve, and I didn't see any other companies in the market solving it. So it was a first-person problem for me. Um, but once I have something that I relate to, then I do the same thing I do when I look for a new employee, which is I go out and validate it in the market with an employee you're out basically doing a blind reference check when you're doing a uh, validation on a new market opportunity for a company you're investing in like Flowcast, I'll show it to five or six or 10 CFO friends of mine and try to get feedback as to whether I think this product's going to fly. In the case of Flowcast, I had probably the highest amplitude positive feedback of any company that I've invested in uh, so far. And so it was kind of an easy investment for us. Beyond that, you're looking for great founders, you're looking for good energy, you're looking for repeated, uh, predictable success. You know, someone in my career early, once fairly early on taught me that the actual results matter to a degree, but it's almost more important that you understand where you're going. So if you say you're going to have a good quarter represented by some certain number, that you actually hit that number. Or if you think you're going to have a bad quarter, if you call that early, at least that demonstrates that you understand the business and that from there you can make positive change or as, as needed. You've really got to understand what's going on. So I look for that as well. On the marketing side, I look for customer fanaticism. And I think that that is something that is oftentimes intrinsic to the product, but it's also intrinsic to marketing. And what I mean by that is, you can create momentum around customer's excitement, excitement in different ways. There has to be native excitement about the product. Customers have to like the product, but you can create it in different ways. So for example, um, you're using a Mac to, to record this interview today. And one of the most startling things I ever heard about a Mac is some, one of my friends posted on Facebook. He posted, um, I can't get XYZ feature to work on my new Mac. It must be me. And he went off, and I'm going to the Apple store to get help. Now, how many tech product, tech support guys are going to laugh if they're listening to this interview? How many times does a customer run into a problem with a technology product and start from it must be me? Not very many times. Most, most people start with the product sucks. It's too hard to use. And even though that is often the case with an iPhone or a Mac, or at least probably just as prevalent with any other type of device or software, um, they've done a good job of convincing people that they have the easiest to use platform. And therefore, if there's a problem, customers immediately point to themselves, not to the company as being the problem. And so there's marketing that goes into that. That's deliberate. It's not accidental in most cases. Mm -hmm. Um, another good example, uh, you know, I, I, you could almost call it leading the witness to a degree, but um, when I was running Case, what our basic marketing platform was, we're a systems management appliance that saves you time and your company money. And we, that's a fairly generic, on the surface, that's kind of a generic value proposition, saving time and money. But when you insert the word you and save you time and you money, it starts to create a more personal feel that people uh, derive a personal benefit from your product. Um, for example, one customer posted on Facebook uh, or Twitter, I can't remember which one, I'm sitting at home patching 3,500 teacher workstations while drinking a beer and watching a football game. Thank you, Case. Um, so saving you time and sa saving the company money it became part of our persona. Now that's interesting and you can market that in a lot of different ways, but if you, you can lead, when I talk about leading the witness, here's what I mean. We went to our user conference one year and we gave a video camera to a guy and said, we want you to go ask every customer you can get in front of, how did the case appliance help save you time and your company money? And we just put a camera in people's faces and had them answer that question. If you have 100 or 200 or 500 people answer the exact same question set up exactly that way, the, res the responses you get are, all sort of parrot the, the qu question you're asking. I saved time and money because of this. Mm -hmm. 
versus if you just went to those same 500 people and say, why do you love your K-Box, you're going to get 500 different answers. That creates a huge different amplitude in, in, in the way you can use that material to market yourself. If you have 500 people responding to the same question in the same way with the same sort of parallel uh, um, uh, syntax, it's much, much more powerful um, verbal overlay and video that you can use all, all around your company versus 500 different answers, which all may be great reasons why people loved your product, but they're not all on point. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be on point. Yeah. On a related note, that's actually really interesting in terms of personalization. One of the things that we really talk about at Instapage is creating a personalized marketing experience with landing pages as the lowest hanging fruit to create that level of personalization. Would you say that when you're looking at potential companies in your experience so far, do you have a specific eye out for personalization? Is that a quality that you think indicates, maybe I should look a little bit deeper. Maybe this is something really cool. Well, when I've seen companies, you know, we have probably 40 investments inside of Toba Capital, but we've probably seen hundreds because we evaluate companies all along the way. And I would say when you see a smart marketing team or a smart sales team, and they're talking about um, hyper-targeted and one-to-one -one style of marketing, I think that perks everybody's ears up. And when they can put kind of, uh, a little meat on the bones and tell you how they're doing that and show you how you're, they're doing that. That just shows us that they've got a buttoned up shop. So that is appealing in some ways. But if you ask me the question a little bit differently, like what do you think the biggest trends in marketing are? I think that pretty clearly one to one type of marketing is probably one of the biggest things out there and account based marketing kind of leads the way around that like what's a particular how's a particular account going to respond to a particular marketing message i think those things are are very very important and i think the other trend that you'll see a lot of is people trying to talk about attribution like what's generating returns for me on the marketing side i think both of those are very important but i think what they both miss to a degree is the importance of what I was talking about before. Two things, one, being on point. I think you have to have a message that can be custom tailored, but it has to be on point in the sense that it's repeated consistently all the time to every customer in a way that they're gonna respond to. Brand consistency. Yeah, if you're jumping all over the place, I just don't think there's that much power in jumping all over the place too much. That's different from one-to-one. -one. You can be on point and one-to-one. -one. I think you have to be both of those things. And then I think the other piece is you have to grab people's attention in a way that's oftentimes irreverent or unique or in some way just stands out from everybody else. And if you just swim in the normal lane of normal marketing, I think people forget that there's the art of marketing. How do you do that? That's another thing that's also a big part of what we think about at Instapage is brand consistency, especially when it comes to loyalty and evangelism in the best case scenario. Let me give you an example in a way that you could deliver one-to-one -one marketing, but you could also be on point. So for example, you might decide that you have a save time, save money value proposition. And so you're talking about the ROI that your product generates for a particular type of customer. Well, you might segment that further and say, Pharmaceutical companies like you generate 2x return on their investment. And so that's a little bit different than saying that companies overall generate a 2x investment, return on their investment. And so if you're going to have a landing page that talks about return on investment, it'd be nice if you just pitch the customer on the return to pharmaceutical companies that the case study, the video, and the ROI study that they get to is all right on point with their industry. would be an example of a little bit more one-to-one -one nature for uh, something that's also specifically on point to how you want to market. That's really, really cool. And again, lines up with so much of what we write about and a lot of the content that I actually created Instapage, as well as a lot of the other marketing influencers and advertising influencers that I speak with on this podcast. Is there also a specific metric or KPI that you're especially sensitive to as an investor, whether it's ARR or churn or maybe something else? There's a lot of different ones that we track, um, and you could do all kinds of reading on Saster and whatnot to look, to look at different ones. I think the things that, that we pay special t attention to would be momentum around ARR. So it's not just uh, what your ARR was year over year, but what was the net new ARR this quarter versus last quarter versus the quarter before. And so how much capacity in, in net new ARR are you able to add? Intrinsic in net new ARR is also a churn concept because basically it's what's net new. It's the new minus what you've churned. So I think those are the things like 
at a at a top level that we look at. We get excited also when we see custom, you know, companies don't often do net promoter score analysis, but when we see, you know, a credible analysis of a net promoter score, that's also pretty compelling. Um, those those would be some some examples. I think the other thing that I like to look for and is very rarely presented to me is the predictability of a particular business. We talked about that earlier in this interview, and I used to tell my VP of sales, it, you know, it's it is probably most important that you make the number, you know, that you have a growth quarter and that you make the number. But, in, but you know, I used to almost go overboard and say to my VP of sales, I actually care more that you're accurate than that you make the number. Two weeks into the quarter, tell me what you're going to do by the end of the quarter and hit that number. If you're under that number or above that number by 10% or more, either way, I'm going to be mad because you didn't tell me what you were going to do. And I couldn't plan accordingly as, a, as either a a CEO or an investor for that outcome. And so I look for predictability in the business. I like to know what did you forecast for the last three quarters and how close did you get to hitting those numbers? Because if I have a predictable, reliable business, then I know I'm putting my money behind something that's solid, that I understand, and that I can expect, you know, even though past performance is not always a predictor of future results, at least I know I'm dealing with a solid foundation to start with. And all of this thinking, obviously, I imagine, applies to the companies that you're on the board of right now. Mm -hmm. What are some of the learnings that you've had in your two to three years as an investor and on the boards of these organizations? I guess one is really just to rehash what we just said, which is the predictability. When, co when companies understand their business and tell me what they're going to do and perform on what they said they were going to do, that's always a very, very good sign because if things are going great, that's great. And if they're going poorly, they understand how to fix them in most cases. Conversely, when you don't see predictability, that's something to get really concerned about and try to really get buttoned down around. Um, so that's first order of business. The other thing I wanted to cover is when you're sitting on a board and you hear about a subtle problem, something that's just starting to creep into the psychology of the CEO or the VP of marketing or whatever, it usually is always important to dig on that earlier rather than later. I think too many times uh, we would look at something and say, well, this is an early problem. We're really not sure if it's a problem yet at all. And we're, let's review this in the next board meeting. And almost always it ends up being a bigger problem than we gave it credit for at the outset. Some of my regrets as a board member relate to not seizing on the opportunity to dig deeper on some of these bigger problems earlier. Those are probably my two biggest things I'd say. Wow, that's really useful. What would you say for founders and entrepreneurs who you're working with as a board member? What are some of the important things for them to keep in mind when working with you as an investor or just investors in general? If you're close to the venture community or have you been a CEO of a tech company, you probably understand these, but I'll, I'll throw them out there for those who might be new to it or, or thinking, contemplating starting a new company. And actually, some of these things apply if you're just a VP of marketing somewhere or a marketing manager for, or something like that. But there shouldn't be surprises. Right? Whether they're upside surprises or downside surprises, transparency, communication, quick communication, and, and not taking it personally is really important. It's like if you're going to go to a board meeting, you don't want to walk in and drop a bomb that says, I just missed the quarter by 25%. You should have like laid the groundwork well before that to, to let someone know that you have, you have concerns. So I think number one in working with me or with anybody else is, is to not, not uh, be surprised by things. I think another one, you know, particularly in dealing with me, like I like to let CEOs run the business. That's what they're hired to do. They're oftentimes founders and I want to give them a lot of credit for the great work they're doing and the fact that they've taken a big life risk to start something and it's their baby. They should be running it. On the flip side, if you surround yourself with great board members and investors, we all oftentimes have great experiences that we can bring to the table. And so finding that interchange and level of trust between a founder and a board or an investor is really important. I've sort of taken the attitude that it's going to take a little bit of time for me to develop that level of rapport. Like I have to show good diligence of giving people good feedback and not being in their face too much, but being constructive and helpful and letting that relationship mature at kind of a normal organic rate. But I think that the quicker you can get to trust with your investor, or your advisor or your employee and that that trust is built on a foundation of you sort of have respect for the work that that person does, the quicker you can benefit from the advice that they're giving you. And I found 
more often than not with founders, it takes a while to develop because VCs tend to have a little bit more of a negative you know, sort of persona with the people they've invested in and they're kind of known as vultures or sharks or whatever. And so there tends to be this divide that needs to get crossed and bridge that needs to get built. This, if you have a good investor, my point is build that bridge sooner rather than later. Listen closely to the, to the feedback that you're getting and internalize it. Try to think about it. Try to Try to do something with it. You know, I know for myself, like my board members, when I was running my own company, for example, one of the most compelling questions they would ask me at the end of every board meeting was, please stack rank your executives. Like one through seven, how would you order rank them in terms of their performance? That doesn't mean that the seventh rated person stinks at their job. It just means that they're seventh on the list. And if they're seventh on the list, there's a reason for that. And if you can dig into what that reason is and be open-minded about it, then you can communicate with that person better. Sometimes it means they, they aren't effective at their job and they need to be gone. Other times it means that someone needs to point out, here's where you could be better. And oftentimes great people respond to that and become better at their job. Yeah, absolutely. Rob, we've talked about many themes throughout the course of this conversation, predictability, creating the culture, and really creating a positive, friendly, honest relationship with all the people you're working with, including those who are under you, your investors, your CEO, et cetera. Where is all this going? What do you see on the high level as the future of marketing and the future of how companies are going to break through the noise? Well, it's interesting. I think, I think that the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, I think somebody who was the top marketer in 1950 in the world would probably be the top marketer in the world today because you can surround yourself with process and tools and one-to-one -one marketing and Eloqua systems and, you know, Hootsuite or whatever you want to use from a marketing automation standpoint um, and whatever the latest tool might be for reaching an audience. Those are sort of tools of the trade, but they're not what make great marketing. What makes great marketing is personality, is charisma, is touching a nerve, is creating a religion. And I think that's what's going to make great marketing in the future. You, know, you have different tools at your disposal, but if you forget that marketing is about a human touch point and hitting that nerve, I think you'll never be a truly extraordinary marketer. It sounds like what you're saying, or at least how I'm interpreting what you're saying, is to never forget about the qualitative components of what you're doing. Despite all the data we have at our disposal to make very informed decisions, there are these narrative and storytelling components that we really do need to hold on to, even as we move forward with artificial intelligence and machine learning and other technical improvements. No, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I get, I get annoyed when I'm in a board meeting and, you know, typically when you have a, C, a VP of marketing where a CEO feels they're not performing quite as well as they should be, then the CEO tends to over-index on marketing attribution. Are these marketing dollars being spent in a productive, good way? And so it's like, how much money did you spend on a, a webinar and what was the return or what was the overall return on your overall marketing budget? I think those are important questions to ask from a directional standpoint and to determine whether you're making progress versus falling behind relative to the prior year. But they really don't mean much because a lot of the best things you can do in marketing are not attributable. Mm -hmm. Coming up with the great, the, the best on point message, coming up with where you can hit a nerve in a unique way, coming up with ways to make your product and service a religion within your customer base are all things that are cult of personality and you know are driven by great personalities and great narratives. And that's not about a dollar for dollar return. Those things done properly create a multiple on everything that you're doing. And so whatever the more modern tool of the day is that you might be using, that's going to amplify the success of that product. But that product won't be successful without that right narrative. And I'm sure that's true what you guys see with your products. If you, you know, people can buy your product and initially the ROI is zero because you've got to load it with the right message. And if you, and I bet if you guys analyze the customers who are engaged with your product, you've got people who are A plus users of your product and you've got people who are B minus users of your product. And I bet if you, more often than not, the difference is in the narrative and the storytelling and, and the cult of personality that those great marketing people are creating within their employee base and within their, within their customer base. 
I completely agree with you. And I'm going to guess that the members of our worldwide listening audience of all-star marketers agree with you and are internalizing a lot of that as well. On that note, Rob, it has been an absolute pleasure. We like to ask people who come on this podcast, we like to ask our guests if there's anything we as the marketing community can do for you or the rest of the marketing community as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. How can we help you and Toba Capital? Well, if you're listening out there and you're involved with a great company seeking an investment, we're venture capitalists. That's what we do for a living, and we like to invest in great companies. So if the ideas of cult of personality and some of the things we talked about are resonating with you and part of the culture that you build, we'd love to talk to you. So please, please look us up at tobacapital.com, T-O-B-A. Excellent. Rob, once again, thank you so much, and we will talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Here are the takeaways from our conversation with Rob Meinhart. Create a culture and create a religion around your product. A cult of personality around your brand is incredibly powerful, and that goes for your team and colleagues as well as your current and potential customers. As an investor, Rob even specifically looks for customer fanaticism in the companies he invests in. Predictability is more important than reaching or even exceeding your goals. Don't let there be surprises. Investors especially like knowing what to expect from the companies in their portfolio. Channel that inner level of trust with your investors and board members as soon as possible. You want to try to build that bridge sooner rather than later. The most important things you can do as a marketer are not necessarily quantifiable. So don't forget about the qualitative components of what you're doing, even if there's no clear dollar for dollar return. Almost anybody with an adequate budget can learn to use the most powerful automation and marketing technology tools available and all the different ad platforms, etc. However, the effectiveness of those pieces of your marketing strategy will be dramatically multiplied with the right narrative and cult of personality around your product. You know, it's not every day that you get to hear the perspective from a board member and advisor who's also a marketing wizard that brought one of his own companies to a successful acquisition by such a big company like Dell. Awesome to have Rob on the show. And as always, a complete transcript and summary of this conversation is available at instapage.com slash podcast. Over the past few episodes, we've talked quite a bit about some very high level and very important marketing themes, macro trends. And the next episode, we're going to get a little more granular and technical, specifically around a few things, including highly incremental experimentation, A-B testing, and looking at lifetime value. We're also shifting gears and trying something a little bit different for the first time. We'll be speaking with two guests, Archie Abrams, the VP of product over at Udemy, and Adam Levinson, who is a growth product manager over there as well. As somebody who previously worked in EdTech, it is a fascinating company that is in many ways paving the path for education technology. And these guys were awesome enough to offer some of their own findings in their marketing at Udemy. Me. So I highly recommend coming back for the next episode. In the meantime, feel free to send me an email if you'd like to. It's ander at instapage.com. That's A-N-D-E-R at instapage.com. And you are more than welcome to reach out about anything and everything that's on your mind. Happy to continue discussing the themes from the conversation on this episode with Rob or any other episode or answer any questions you might have about what we do at Instapage. More than happy to help you however I can. And that goes for the rest of the team as well. We are especially active on social media. All right, my fellow marketers, I am out for now. My name is Ander, and this is Advertising Influencers. Cheers to your future success, and cheers to better marketing. I will talk to you soon. Advertising Influencers. Conversations with today's top-tier marketers from Silicon Valley and beyond. Powered by Instapage, the most powerful landing page solution.